Hello and welcome back to Jump To It for irishracing.com. My name's Joe Ryan. I'll be your host and in this show we are packed full of news, previews and some top betting tips from our expert panel. We are a full house today, so it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you Stephen Harris, Ed Quigley and Vincent Finnegan from irishracing.com. Now, Vincent, I want to start with you as well. Saw your blog post on irishracing.com. How good was it to have some top class racing again after maybe some less savoury news over in Ireland last week? That was fantastic. Both the, the British and Irish racing last weekend was top class. We saw some fantastic performances. Probably a Clutard was the main one. Whether it's enough to say the horse should be favoured now for the Gold Cup, I'm not quite sure. Um, but it was a fantastic performance all the same. Foot perfect all the way throughout. Um, things are looking up here. Um, after after that week, you'd certainly feel that the National Hunt season is really gearing up into top gear. And this weekend, we've got some fantastic action uh, due at Fairy House on Sunday with three great ones. Now, we will get to some of the, the rest of the team's eye catches as well later on in the show. But I wanted to just pull up the one story about all class at Punchestown on Tuesday. A bit of a gamble was landed on this horse as well, backed in from four to one into 13 to eight. Uh, Favourite and won by some distance as well. So, Stephen, as you're basically our former bookmaker on, sh uh, on the show here, just give us your take on that performance and what happened in the betting ring as well. What do you make of it? Well, I mean, I think we've got to be a bit careful here, Joe, because what I actually think is probably something I shouldn't be saying on a, on a sort of show that can be watched around the world and in Ireland. I mean, watching the race, I think the commentator quite rightly said it was a very odd race, and that was putting it extremely politely. But the, <laughs> the moves in the in the in the market beforehand, basically, what happens on course is pretty irrelevant. It's all off course now. It's all exchange driven, and whatever the prices are on Betfair, they're the shows from the track. Um, there's very few punters go racing, although maybe in Ireland that's slightly different. But uh, basically, it was a very well-executed plot. The horse did have winning form in the past. He'd obviously been laid out for the day. Um, that's one thing. That's good training. And obviously, McNally's got previous for landing these huge touches where the whole world's on. What was different about this particular race was the manner in which it was run. Two of them went two fences clear unchallenged and stayed there. I mean, if you're a bookmaker, you'd be screaming the place down if you've done your money on it, to be honest with you. Uh, quite what's going to come of it, no one knows. It, it's a very difficult thing to prove. What they actually needed to do on the day was to get every single jockey in on, from the race and take down written statements from them. want to find out what on earth is going on because basically, um, from a punter's point of view, it looked absolutely horrendous. Um, some people might have described it as a carve-up where they're all on the one, but that wouldn't be for me to say, obviously, with lawyers listening in, Joe. <laughs> and how about for you, Vincent, as well, obviously, with punches down uh, where it's where it took place. So just have your view on that incident. On the incident, well, look, basically, the stewards went and brought in um, all the jockeys from behind saying that they sat too far back. Their actual phrase they had was they gave the front two a generous lead and the jockeys themselves basically said that they had all started to go at the right time um, at the start of the race but there were a couple of fallers at the first and that messed up the the complexion of the race from there on it's hard to, it's hard to know whether that's all absolutely true or not or what the instructions were but, but there's there's certainly no case in my mind that everyone else didn't try in behind that it's hard enough to it's hard enough i'd say to try and get one horse to either try or stop or whatever it may be but to try and do it with 16 different people i'd say it's impossible um so realistically this ronald mcnally it's a, he's he's some character with what he's done so far and um, this horse all class that was his first run in a chase for ronald mcnally so you can't blame him for the handicap mark that was done by a previous trainer a guy called patrick griffin a couple of years ago got him handicapped or um he was handicapped on runs for him the same with uh, the Ronald McNally horse, this all class. He was actually trained by a guy called David Peter Dunn last year. Some very interesting things with this horse. Like he, he landed a gamble on the flat one day, back from 66 to 1 to 9 to 2, which is um, hero stuff, really. But there was another day he ran prior to that, which is really interesting betting trend. I've never seen anything like it. He went from 200 to 1 in the morning. Uh, this is for a racing dumb dog. He went from 200 to 1, back all the way into 11 to 2, and then somehow drifted back out to 100 to 1. So, I, it's, it really is remarkable. So, like, was it real money? What was it? I have no idea how, how that can happen because you'd, you'd imagine if you're a bookmaker and you'd, you'd laid something at 200 to 1 all the way into 11 to 2, there's no way you ever put 100 back to it at any stage, regardless of what you know. 
So um, I haven't said that the horse fit, trailed in down the field that day, didn't show, but came out the next day. And the money was obviously on 66s into 9 to 2. Um, McNally has been doing it with quite a few horses. There was an interesting um, incident the other day or a report from the IHRB. Um, into he had complained about a horse he has on the flat i can't remember the name of it at the moment but it has run i think seven seven or eight times and hasn't got a handicap mark and the basic reason for this you normally have a handicap mark after three runs you'd be guaranteed to get one sometimes the handicapper can ask to see a fourth run but they brought in a rule i think it's four years ago they brought it in that if a horse doesn't run to to an ability or show an ability of a rating of 45 the handicapper doesn't give it a rating so this horse has been run seven times now and still hasn't got a rating the best they can make up for it is one run. It nearly ran to 42. But, so McNally was put back in his box with that one. Anyway, you can't get a handicap mark for that, so he have to keep going, I'd say. But Ed, just to get your view as well on this story, I mean, what does it do for the kind of a, the impression of racing as well when you get these kind of, yeah, almost like a farce, right, at Punchestown? Yeah, I mean, on the list of one to about 83 things that are wrong with the game in a moment, yeah, just from a... A fan, as, as kind of spectator point of view, just an absolute non-entity the race, wasn't it? I mean, I, I, I didn't see it live, but watched the replay. Just thought, I just thought it was quite funny. <laughs> I thought fair play to everyone involved. I, I kind of saw it in a different light. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, who knows what's exactly happened there. But um, as you say, you can't really take anything away from the winning connections. It's more of a, a case of... You know, 95% of the field just seemed oblivious to what was going on. And, you know, the reasons for that were obviously the... And as Vincent says, the, the stewards have looked into it. Like, you know, what will come of it, I don't know. Mm. But uh, as you say, yeah, just uh, as a spectator, forgetting betting, forgetting all those mm. kind of angles, just to watch it, it was just a, just a big non-event. And the reasons which led to that, I suppose, only maybe a, a select few will probably know. Well, speaking of a well, bit of a non-event, but potential non-runner going into the Tingle Creek next week, I want to get your view on Shiskin, Ed. Uh, so what do you think of his withdrawal from the race? How, how will that change the makeup of the Tingle Creek? Well, how it changes the makeup is huge, isn't it? He's, he's the anti-post favourite. Uh, he's gone now uh, in a funny kind of way. It might actually mean we get a bigger feel for the Tingle Creek because now every everyone might end up saying, well, let's just roll the dice. Let's have a, let's have a go at it, if you see what I'm saying. Uh, look, I, I'm going to need a separate 10-minute rant <laughs> next week uh, to go on about things. Uh, you know, I'm ambivalent overall with the view from Nicky Henderson. Look, at the end of the day, if he's not happy with his horse, it's hard to say it doesn't run. There seems to be this... School of thought, uh, still set in the 1980s, that uh, connections, owners and trainers are there to serve the sport. And I very much think, you know, whilst that we all like to think that it would be the case emotionally, very few are of that mindset. I, I you know, I'm in the Cotswolds, uh, Joe. I go to a lot of these uh, kind of owners open days. Once they've had a couple of scrubby jacks in them, they've discovered this new <laughs> Range Rover they're going to buy. I've, I've, I've witnessed, I've witnessed trainers, uh, uh, owners say to trainers, at all costs, do not run my horse. You know, I'll pay you 25000 a year not to run this horse as long as we get him fit for Cheltenham. Uh, bubble wrap him, keep him fit for... If, it, if the Grand National is the target, do whatever you got to do. Do not run this horse. Get him right for the one race in entry where we pay 15000 to have our box and eat lobster and have a good day out. And, you know, all this kind of, all oh, in the 1980s, Desert Orchid ran nine times in the season. We were not in the 1980s anymore. It doesn't... the. That, so whether that's right or wrong is a different matter. Mm. But my overall view to kind of summarise is I would take the prerogative out of the individual that the sport itself needs restructuring. You shouldn't be kind of redundant to what a trainer or an owner or so-and-so wants to do at the 11th hour in order to promote your sport. I've said it for a long time, uh, and this would just be a snippet of what would be a, a seven-hour rant on this show, would be <laughs> in two, terms of the two-mile division, I wrote about this in Owner Breeder magazine a while ago, I would bring in a per temps qualifier style or points-based system to get you yeah. into Charter Festival races, especially in the two-mile division. You've got the Schlur Chase, Tingle Creek, Desert Orchid, Clarence House, and the Game Spirit. That's five races. Now, someone with a finer mind than myself can work out the qualification criteria, but something along the lines of you've got to have run in four of them or you've got to have placed in three of them or if you if you win two of them, you put your ticket to the champion chase. There needs to be a, something enforced from above to meet these horses to meet during the season because, as I said, it's become, whether you like it or not, and people, it's this denial which makes me mm. irate, is I've spoken to owners who the previous August have literally said... 
they don't care if the horse doesn't run all season as long as they can win at the Cheltenham Festival and they would be happy to win at the Cheltenham Festival there was no prize money involved. Mm. Prize money's a dud. No one cares about it. These people, you know, you go on company's house. Some of these owners have net worths of 80, 90 million. So when I, I, I just crack up laughing when I see some headline on Twitter going, oh, an extra 8,000 has been thrown onto the so-and-so herd on mm. Saturday afternoon. I mean, mm. that doesn't cover the interest in the offshore ISA. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just absolute nonsense, you know, um, to be honest with you. I, I just think the structure from the top needs to change. And there needs to that is what needs to change because at the moment I say unless you've got a uh, a trainer uh, and ownership kind of synergy a bit like Paul Nichols has got where he has a lot of owners who buy into the fact that it's not all about the Cheltenham Festival and they buy into the fact that week on the Saturday races outside of Cheltenham are the ones we really want to win. If you're training and your owners are all on the same wavelength, that's fine. But there's numerous owners, there's numerous trainers who just think the big payday is either Charter Festival or the one race at Aintree we're getting right for and the rest of the season is, is, is irrelevant. And we see that. Uh, we've been talking off air beforehand that a lot of the Monday to Friday stuff and even some Saturday stuff now is just absolute garbage. And the truth is a lot of the owners and the trainers or the owners specifically just don't care. Now, whether they should be there to serve the sport becomes quite a heated political debate. But I just think that if the structure was changed from above, it wouldn't give um, the individual the option to kind of jump through these loopholes. As we all know it now, you can you can see how wrong this is, but play, happily play this back in six months' time if I'm wrong. Shishkin will go straight to Kempton as a fours on shot and win the Desert Orchid. He'll be on target for the game spirit. The ground will turn heavy. He won't run. And he'll have a race course gallop a week before the champion chase. So you're trying to market. You're one of your best assets to the racing game. Who's going to run in a fours on race and a four runner race over the Christmas period on ITV racing. And it won't be seen again to the mm -hmm. festival. But oh, if he wins the champion chase by a neck, Henderson's happy. Owners are happy. Nico's happy. 72,000 people there on the day are happy. And then you won't see him again for another six months. So it's that whole kind of self-serving interest versus... The sports interest and as i repeat final time if you didn't give the option uh to have the self-serving interest then we wouldn't have a lot of these debates it'd be the way mm -hmm. i'd see it and, uh, and i also find a fi final point joe because it is mm -hmm. worth for a bit of balance i think it is worth saying with nicky henderson I, I don't think he helps himself in the sense that he i don't know whether it's through his um he's, he's sponsored by a major bookmaker and they like to kind of push him down avenues he comes out and nominates these targets for these horses uh, whereas someone like Willie Mullins is very, as I say, suitably vague. You read his pre-season tour and it's kind of, yeah, well, we're getting right for a big race. Not quite sure where yet, blah, 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 blah. Whereas Nicky Henderson, it's champs going to the Betfair chase. Shiskins go straight to the Tingle Creek. Algeor's going to go to here. And then when they don't go there, everyone kind of hangs onto the coattails and then just falls about in tears. Um, so that's the same. If he'd said, well, look, we don't know where Shiskins going to start, but he will be back at some point. We probably wouldn't have this kind of meltdown in social media circles. So anyway, that was my seven hour run. I've got down to about three and a half <laughs> minutes, but um, I think it's multifaceted. It's a wider picture than just Shishkin's not running. I do think we've been saying Kevin Blake's um, written a, a very good article, mm. and, you know, a few points I, I disagree with, but I thought he hit a nail on the head on a lot of the right things. I, I think you're not going to fight the Cheltenham Festival. You're not going to defeat that. A lot mm. of there's so many people are wired so the fact that is the be all and end all, you've got to accept that. And what you've got to do is work out how you get the rest of the season to kind of go hand in hand with it rather than fighting each other. And so, yeah, I think there's lots of things that need to be looked into. But again, as uh, myself and Stephen say, um, I think we we're on the show about this time last year. We said that nothing will change and uh, we'll go forward next year. And um, yeah, we'll still be having the same conversations. Well, Ed, something you did touch on there as well is the prize money and the structure of it. So over in France, actually, they just recently announced that prize money is going up back up to 2017 levels as well due to the growth of the PMU as well. So, Stephen, I want to get your views on basically on that and what impact do you think that mm. could have on British and Irish racing? And should we look to kind of replicate that model in Britain and Ireland to kind of then get more of these more interesting races throughout the year? Well, I mean, the key thing, Joe, is that uh, in France and in Ireland, there's a lot less racing than there is in the UK. So that's why they've got so much more prize money. It's not just a case of, well, it's complicated. In Ireland, the government's much more involved. It's a complete livelihood. It, it's much more supportive. And in France, they have the PMU and there's nowhere else to bet, basically. So all the money does go back into racing. So it is complicated. I mean, I don't, I don't want a sport where all you can do is bet into the tote. I, I would I'd just be not interested in it, to be honest. It would cease as a betting medium for me immediately if I could not play on betting exchanges or with bookmakers 
And I think that's true of a very large number of people. It, it's no good just having a, a, a tote where, you know, uh, all the money goes in and the, the, the one, you know, idea what price you're getting. It's no, it's a lovely hobby. I'm sure if maybe racing would thrive, but you'd iron out a great deal of punters if that was just the case, particularly given the, the levels of turnover that are likely. So no, I mean, uh, to keep things brief, France have massively boosted their prize money. They race very rarely. Nobody ever goes racing in France bar about three meetings a year. If you go to Deauville, a beautiful place to go racing, by the way, uh, there'll be 200 people there away from the sort of festival they have in the summer. It's a, it's a non-event, but betting cafes, um, the PMU it does well. It's a very high margin product, by the way. We're used to betting into 102% mm. on Betfair. Uh, and with the bookmakers, you've got to get used to 130 odd in France, as we do in our own tote here a lot of the time. So, uh, no, uh, it's a difficult and very complicated issue. But obviously, the, the long and the short of it is that France and Ireland are doing OK with prize money, whereas in the UK, it continues to fall off a cliff. Uh, and we're seeing the result of that now. Um, the, I mean, the, I was, Ed and I were chatting off air about this, but the last few days racing has been absolutely diabolical. I mean, I love low grade racing, but this week now. People are saying it's down to the ground. I'm not actually sure it is. I just think that we are mm. now we're reaching the bottom of the well in terms of what horses are available to run midweek in the UK. That there's so much racing, so much all weather racing that it's sort of fallen off a cliff. And obviously this dry spell has sort of brought it forward a bit. But anyway, hopefully we've got better things to talk about over the weekend coming up. Well, speaking of perhaps better things to talk about as well, we're going to look back a little bit at uh, Haydock last week. I want to just highlight the performance of Brave Man's Game, winning the graduation chase, of course. So, Stephen, what did you make of that performance and where do you think he can go from here? Yeah, I mean, Brave Man's Game, Joe, is devastatingly impressive. He's a brilliant jumper. And, of course, we've got Bob Ollinger in Ireland as well. Absolutely spectacular. Both of them are amazing. I've actually got a horse to follow um, from that Brave Man's Game race, which is Anne Hamilton's uh, Pay the Piper. Uh, he's only run four times over fences. He needs three miles. He was under pressure a long way out behind Brave Man's Game, as they all were. But he stuck on really strongly after the last. And I think with, with Pay the Piper, because he's not trained in the south, it's a small northern yard, you might find that he might be underrated. It really well in one of the handicaps at the festival if they go down that route. I doubt he's a grade one winner, but he could definitely win a hot handicap as his stamina is drawn out. Now, Ed, I also want to bring you in here about Aplutard, the winner of the Betfair Chase, of course. What did you make of that race and what a great performance it was by the favourite? Oh, it was, it was spectacular. I mean, what a round of jumping. Uh, didn't touch a twig. Rachel Blackmore, you know, hit the turbo in the closing stages. Ah, oh, it was wonderful. I mean, I'm a, I'm a little bit kind of... Um, Annoyed, it's far too strong. There's more things in life to annoy me than. But everyone seems to be kind of swiping away the performances. You know, put it this way: beforehand, it was it was an absolutely stunning renewal, and it was really competitive. He wipes the floor with them by 22 lengths, and it was ah, oh, the race fell apart, and this didn't go right. I mean, I will make your mind up. It was either a very mm. good race or it wasn't. I think there is the, the bigger question is: does he deserve to be as short as three to one? On the back of that, given that he was 13 to two beforehand, uh, he probably was a bit flattered in truth. And the fact that, you know, Bristol and I didn't go a yard, waited patiently, didn't go a yard. Imperial Laura, who would be my mm. catcher from the weekend, was starting to close and was jumping pretty well until the point he threw David Bass out. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, crikey, a 22 length winner at a Betfair chase. Uh, phenomenal. I think he deserves to be Gold Cup favourite. I think on balance, because he's still only seven. Uh, I think his best days are probably still ahead of him. Whether he deserves to be as short uh, as three to one for the Chatham Gold Cup, I suppose, is a different issue. But he heads the Savills chase next, all being well. And then he won't run again after that until the, the Gold Cup, Henry de Brom heads confirmed. But um, I think it's a brilliant performance. But um, I'll throw in my own catch whilst we're on the topic. Uh, Imperial Aura would be, <coughs> excuse me, my one from that. I still think he's got unfinished business to overstaying trips. And for you, Vincent, do you think Abu Tard now is the best chaser out there at the moment? Or do you think maybe it's not been a little bit overplayed? I think he may not even be the best chaser in his own yard. So that's the, the key to this. Like, <laughs> there's some strength and depth in, in the brown heads at the minute. Um, Envoy Allen, we have no idea how good this horse is. That's mm. the bottom line. We know there was a couple of blips early um, or in the, the latter end of last season between uh, Cheltenham and Punchestown, but there were excuses both days. One of them was just a fall, and the other one, the, the horse was lame or whatever. So, like, Envoy Allen could still be absolutely anything. Then you've got Manella Indo, who we know beat a Plutard fair and square in Cheltenham last March. So, like, the the, the Plutard win 
it, it wasn't the Cheltenham distance, it wasn't the Cheltenham course, it wasn't against Cheltenham Gold Cup opposition, realistically. Most of them happen to lie in Ireland at the minute. So we're looking at the case. Let's see how the season unfolds. It's a long way to, to Cheltenham, as we know at this stage, even though everyone is, it's on everyone's lips already. Um, for me, the other, the other novice that um, Henry de Bromhead ran last weekend, Bob Ollinger, I, that, that was a fair performance. He ran Gorn Park last Saturday. Okay, it was a big field, whereas we know Braveman's game ran against uh, a select couple of couple in opposition. But although it was a big field in the Gorn Park race, there weren't too many that got involved. Um, he was up front with Bacardi's. Now, Bacardi's would be a fair yardstick, a uh, decent staying hurdle on his day. This is his third spell William Mullins has sent him over fences with. He's, he's fallen each of the last times he's sent him over fences. He's had a fall and he's put him back over hurdles. So it was a good, it was a good enough display from Bacardi's, but Bob Ollinger was, was different class than that. He looked really good. There's three tricky fences in the straight in Goran Park. Um, the first one particularly catches out a lot when they turn in. I don't know what the reason, but I think it's slightly downhill. And then the last fence is another one that, that um, you got an awful lot of followers at the last in Goran over the years. He, he made slight errors at, at the two of them, but he found his feet. He carried on. He won real well. He could be anything. We saw him last year in Cheltenham, how good, how good he looked um, off a light novice campaign of hurdles. Interesting to see where he goes next, but sure, he could be anything. Another year or two, he's a Gold Cup contender, you would imagine. And Vincent, we will get to your tips later on in the show as well. I just wanted to highlight from last week, you did pick out Buzz in the Coral Hurdle as well at Ascot. So give us your assessment of that race and the performance of the winning. Uh, yeah, the winning it, was, it was a decent performance. In, sorry, Joe, it was a decent performance from Buzz. Realistically, the only reason I was picking him out as the nap of the weekend last weekend was to take on Goshen. Um, it's... That's a, that's a strategy I have with some of these. When you find one, you think that that's going to be over bet all of the time, and it's all based on one or two performances a long time ago. You're, you're well worth getting stuck in here, and Buzz did it with the minimum of fuss. Very confident performance, and um, won real well. Has a big season ahead, I'd say. Whether he's absolute top class, I'm not sure, but he was certainly a good thing last Saturday. Great stuff. Well, hopefully there's some more winners coming up in the tip section. But now we're going to move on to preview some of the big races of the weekend, starting off on Sunday at Fairy House. So the first race we're going to look at is the 105 at Fairy House. This is a race won by the likes of Hardy Eustace in the past, Hurricane Fly as well, Envoy Allen. Uh, but Vincent, why do you like the look of my mate Mozzie in this one? Yeah, well, realistically, I'm, this is all about ground Sunday. That's the, the big key to Fairy House this weekend is going to be the ground. There's been very little rain in Ireland. The ground is currently good, good to yielding in places. There was one and a half millimetres yesterday, I think. They're due some showers on Friday, but it's due to be a dry and breezy weekend, which will probably dry the ground out again. So that's the that's the key to all of this. We've got three cracking grade one contests. Um, Normally, they're, they're three of the races of the season in Ireland each year. We, as you said, some of the some of the winners of this in the past, the likes of the Moscow Flowers, Hurricane Fly, um, Envoy Allen, Mos um, Hardy Eustace, all serious horses have won this novice hurdle. My mate Mozzie will go on the ground. It's already a three-time winner over hurdles. So that, that, for me, is the key in itself because there's quite a few of these. You have to have big question marks on the ground. Um, Gordon Elliott has a has a very good record in this. Him and Willie Mullins, I think they've won the last seven renewals of this race between them. And Gordon Elliott provides the, the main danger to his farrier, Gavin Cromwell, who has my mate Muzzy. Um, Gordon Elliott has Mighty Potter, won a bumper and won then in Down Royal recently as well, both on soft ground. So you have a query about that. The betting at the minute they make my mate Muzzy is about a six to four chance and um, Mighty Potter, seven to four. I, I'd be definitely in the in the uh, Gavin Cromwell camp here because of the, because of the ground issue. That's the, that's the main factor for me in this race. And Ed, any angle in for you for this uh, the big race of Fairy House, the first of the three big races that we're going to feature? <clears throat> well, it's just interesting listening to what Vince was saying there. I mean, listening to Gordon Elliott's quotes, it, actually, it sounds like three-stripe life might be taking his chance in this. So obviously, bolted up at one to seven over course of distance last time out. I mean, he had some terrific bumper form, didn't he? Of course, he was fourth in the Channel Festival bumper uh, behind, um, you know, Kill Crut and Sir Gerhard, uh, et cetera, which is which is excellent form. It's interesting listening to what he was saying about the horse, that he's pretty much bred to stay. He's bred to be a three-miler, yet 
he's kind of showing him speed he wasn't expecting. So that's why they're kind of sticking to two miles for now, uh, if you see what I'm saying. So I wonder in time whether he might be more of a kind of two and a half mile type by the end of the season. But um, yeah, three stripe life. It, the ground was pretty lively when he won last time out. And uh, I mean, he fairly bounced off it, albeit at a low level. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's a cracking little renewal. It's always a really good race, this isn't it? But I think, yeah, we'll get my mate Mozzie. We might get two in here for the Gordon Elliott. And um, Cole Murphy's horse is going to run as well, isn't he? Impervious, who's, who's unbeaten. So, always a great race and uh, very informative as far as the rest of the season goes. And let's move on to the 135, the uh, the Drinmore Novice Chase as well. Again, won by some stellar names in the past. Envoy Allen, again, a winner of this race as well. Uh, but Lifetime Ambition looks like the current Antipose favourite. Stephen, what's your assessment of this race? And uh, is that a worthy favourite? Yeah, I mean, this could be another cracking race. As Vincent says, I should think it'll be nearly good ground by looking at the weather forecast. I thought Lifetime Ambition was really impressive from the front on his chasing debut. He's a prolific winning hurdler for Harrington. He took to it like a duck to water. Um, the key here, this might end up not being loads of runners, perhaps. And if mm. Lifetime Ambition gets another soft lead, he could jump them into the ground and have them in trouble a long way out. So I thought he was the standout favourite, but I think it's more of a race to watch and learn for the future, to be honest, uh, rather than get too financially involved in. Great stuff. Well, let's move on to the next race, the big one on Sunday as well, where Honeysuckle looks to become a three-time winner of the race as well. So, uh, Ed, how do you rate Honeysuckle overall? And, you know, who presents a bit of a worthy challenge in this one? Wow. Uh, I mean, uh, she's priced at, what, round two's on? Uh, I think that uh, pretty much sums it up, Joe. Uh, there's not much more insight I could add uh, <laughs> other than that. She's the best horse. She's destroyed everything last year. Uh, there was one school of thought she's... Uh, I actually, because I covered this issue on the chat on the preview night, on in terms of racing post ratings, uh, are two uh, least impressive performances or lowest ratings have both come on the quickest ground she's encountered. That would, only, if you're clutching at straws, that would be the, the slight issue, given that the ground could be fairly rattling uh, by the time the race comes along. However, this is over two and a half miles, not the minimum trip. So I don't think it's going to be too much of a, a, an issue. Classical dream, I don't know what to make of. He's kind of done this bolt out of a blue after two years on the sideline, Sydney, when winning it punches down in the stairs at the back end of last season. Uh, I don't really know. I, I, I think the strong travelling abracadabra has, has got a good turn of foot. Sees around the eight to one mark. Wouldn't be, it sounds like he's going to run. And I think he could probably travel. He'll, he'll always travel into contention. Uh, it sounds like, funny enough, they're going to go down the staying hurdle route with Abacadabra as they're going to try something different with him this season. So I think Honeysuckle wins. Uh, it sounds like she'll, she's going to be revved up enough to do herself justice. And I think Abracadabra's will travel into the race and probably follow her home. But um, yeah, Honeysuckle, it's just a case of so we're waiting for something to kind of jump out the woodwork a bit to challenge her in the, the kind of champion hurdle mm. category at the moment. And um, yeah, we're kind of uh, we're scratching our heads, put it that way. And Vincent, for you, do you see any other kind of alternative angles into this one, or is it just honeysuckles to lose? Uh, I'd, I'd be a little bit worried about her here. Um, the ground is the issue, first off. Um, she's never won on good ground, as far as I know. Uh, she's always had a cut in the ground. Maybe there'll be a slight cut in the ground, but that would be a tiny bit of a worry. The other thing is that she looked so much better over two miles in the latter half of last season than she had done previously over the two and a half, for, for certainly for a few runs. She, She's won this race the last twice. She's gone for three in a row. Um, Apples Jade did it before. Salarina did the same. Another horse, Limestone Lad, won the race three times. So, like, the history's there for, for these repeat winners of this contest. But last year, she only won this by half a length from Ronald Pump, who's also going to be in the race again. He's very likely raced. He only appears every six months or so. So, up against him again, there's a, there's two the two Willie Mullins horses, if they run. Classical Dream is one... He, he was a star when he won the Supreme Novice. Um, obviously, he had problems, but he didn't have fans back, as Ed was saying, last year in Punchestown. And then you've got the other horse, Salier, or Salier, um, won a goal we heard it off top weight. He, he's a fair horse. He's, after, he's, he's coming here with a couple of runs under his belt as well. I, I don't think this is a, is a foregone conclusion. It's no penalty kick. I haven't said that she's a super mare. She's unbelievable. She's still unbeaten. I know this time last year I asked the question, who'd be beaten first, Honeysuckle or Envoy Allen? It turns out it was Envoy Allen. Uh, mm. She's still a beat. Like, this is going on forever, isn't it? If she wins this, she probably just goes back to two miles over Christmas or whatever, or maybe February in, in uh, Dublin Racing Festival and then on to Cheltenham over two again. Like It's very hard to see anything beat her over two, but I just think she might just be a little bit vulnerable here. Two and a half, good ground. She was only a half length winner of the same race last year, so... She's no absolute certainty, though she is probably unbeatable. 
looks like it's going to be get yeah, the odds on favorite so maybe not so much value into the race but yeah fascinating contest indeed now moving on to friday where we do, do have another fascinating contest perhaps a pointer to the stayers hurdle at cheltenham where paisley park comes up against indefatigable in the long distance hurdle at newbury stephen let's get your thoughts on this race how do you see it shaping up well they've, they've put chick pieces on paisley park but i think he might be one of those horses who might have had enough um, his flat spots that he always used to hit seem to be getting longer and longer and he looked mm. very laboured a long way out um, first run back of the season big pieces will wake him up a bit but I think he's a bad price two to one to be honest not for me I thought it's a small field and Nicky Henderson's on the blind side could get a soft lead I'm hoping Nico De Boyne will have front run he'll like the decent-ish ground um, he ran an absolute screamer in the Aintree Stayers Hurdle behind Time Hill last season when he was still in front two out despite being driven mad on the lead and he only got tired after the last. I could see him rolling along in front on his own at Newbury uh, and taking a little bit of catching. That He might be the sort of horse on goodish ground, might have a little bit more natural pace than some of these sluggards, but I see he's a double-figure price and he'd be my selection. And Ed, do you have a potential value pick in this one as well? I mean, I know you've liked the look of Thomas Darby in the past. Yeah, this is a great race, isn't it? This is a who's who of Chowton Festival winners, haven't you? You've got uh, Paisley Park, Liz Nagar Oscar, both previous winners of the Stayers. Indefatigable won the uh, Martin Pipe, and uh, Miss Milner won the Per Attempts. It really is it's, it's a, a wonderful contest, this. But yeah, Thomas Darby uh, only managed second in the Supreme, so he falls down on, on that category. But um, yeah, I, I watched back the Weatherby run uh, from last time out, where Indefatigable won it. Uh, Paisley Park stayed on in the third. And Thomas Darby was fourth on that occasion. I watched the replay again. Thomas Darby travels like a dream into the home straight and then just uh, just totally emptied. You know, basically, it's like 10 o'clock at night when my, my wife says to me, oh, you haven't taken the bins out. I suddenly become all devoid of energy. Like, um, <laughs> and, and, and basically, that was that was Thomas Darby in, in that race, I, I think, basically. The, he tanked through and then just stopped. I'll be very interested with that run under his belt. The Ollie Murphy team are absolutely flying. They put the tongue tie on him because I noticed his head went in the air in the closing stages. So something to bear in mind whether he just had an issue with his tongue and that's why he couldn't go through with his effort. He's getting six pounds from Paisley Park as well, let's not forget. I think he's a strong traveller. He should improve for that fitness-wise. He's three times the price of Paisley Park. There wasn't much behind them at Weatherby. And if any horse is going to improve, I think, Thomas to Derby's trajectory is likely to still be going upwards. Paisley Park is, is not getting any younger. I'm not sure how many more times he can keep going to the well. You know, they've thrown the cheap pieces on now on Paisley Park to try and sharpen him up. But uh, uh, yeah, I think Thomas Darby, again, he's a little bit of an abracadabra in the sense that he will travel into any race beautifully. And he may not always find as much as you think, but uh, I think he's right in the mix here. As I said, if you're just looking at prices, he's three times the price of Paisley Park. He gets six pounds from him. There wasn't much between them at Weatherby. And I think he will improve a lot for that run. And Vincent, any view from you onto this race? Well, yeah, I'd be opposing Paisley Park. That's the first thing. He's one win from six and last six, I think. He's cheap piece his first time. He's a horse that hits this flat spot during his races. So I, I'd be inclined to take him on. The issue for me is I'm not sure what to take him on with. That's the problem. I don't think the Irish horse, Mrs. Miller, is good enough. Um, indefatigable, it's a good performance the last day. Is it really good enough? Like the, the handicapper left it on the same mark after that, dropped Paisley Park a couple of pounds. I'm just not sure. It was an early season, an early season run as well. I wouldn't put you off Tom Starby or whatever else in it, but just for me, Paisley Park is opposable. That's the that's the main uh, point I'd take out of it. So potentially, yeah, a value in the lay there if you're looking at the Betfair exchanges. All right, so we're going to move on to the three o'clock on Saturday's card at Newbury, of course, the Labricks Trophy Chase. A bit more of a wide open affair here. We've got lots of runners entered. Uh, so, Stephen, take us through your thoughts and basically how do we attack this one as a punter? Um, I'm going to stick with Enrillo here, Paul Nichols. He, he won the Bet365 Gold Cup last season and then got disqualified. Obviously, that well-documented stewards inquiry. He's only had a handful of runs over fences. He's a thorough stayer. He's been trained for this race. The only negative is I think he's now about five or six to one, which is probably a short enough price in a race of this nature. But I do think he's the standout contender. He, he's got lots more improvement to come, I suspect. And Nichols is so good on these Saturdays for having them peak at the right time. So I thought he was the, the standout contender. It, it's probably a race again. Um, if you're going to have a bet, bet each way and find a bookie offering six places. We say the same every week, Joe, but it is one of those huge field mm. handicaps. 
very competitive and bookmakers are anxious to take your money. So play each way when the terms are in your favour. And how about for you, Ed? I know you like like a long shot now and again. So uh, any kind of interest for you here at a big price? Well, and usually for me, there's nothing really floating my boat at the bigger prices. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> to summarise, we, we all know that there's basically been two Vida Field have been harping on about for some time. Um, the long-term project was Eclat de Rear, who we've talked about the, the power in the Henry de Bromhead uh, stable over fences. Obviously, I've tipped and back this horse to win the Charlton Gold Cup. And I think... If we got a softer, heavy ground gold cup, he wouldn't be out of place in that lineup. Put it that way. He was so close to being my my ten units, ten point win, all in on Rachel for this race. See you later, alligator. I'm just nervous about the ground. It's going to be lively. Uh, there's no rainfall. I mean, there's a half a millimetre shower forecast on Friday. It's going to be there's going to be more good than there is soft in it. Put it that way. That would be my only reservation. I, I'm convinced he's so well handicapped to collect the race. He's got to be better than 154. Uh, it's just on this ground, is he better than 154? That, so that's the only reason I'm not going with him. The other horse I've mentioned for the race for a long time is Fiddler on the Roof. And I just think, again, he's got the perfect kind of profile for this. Second season chaser. Uh, the Tizards are absolutely flying. Team Tizard are back. All the doubters are crying into their Horlicks. Mm. And I'm absolutely chuffed yeah. at the moment. I think he's... Um, yeah, the, the yard of firing around a 25% strike rate. They're only, what, 10? We're only in November. It is our team. We're only 10 winners shy of their entire, entire total for mm. last season. We've got five months to go to the end of the jump season. So that just goes to show how out of form it is our to last season. Lovely comeback to win that listed race at, at Carlisle. And, of course, you go back to last season when so many of the Tizard horses weren't running well. This horse chased home Monkfish when he stayed all the way to the line in the in the Festival Novices chase. Crikey. A replication of that form, You're finishing second to Monkfish off 150 in a handicap. I think he's got to be bang there, personally. As Stephen says, it wouldn't normally be my type of bet, but check your each way concessions. If you can kind of get 11 to 2, six places, I'm, with a clear round, I'm shocked to see how he's kind of out of the frame. He's got to come there travelling again. I think him and a clap de rear are the two best handicapped horses in the field. It's just the, the ground conditions, I just feel, ultimately may have gone against the clap de rear on this occasion. But um, yeah, may have my 2 the field, but uh, on the value grounds and with trip and ground in his favour and the yard flying, uh, yeah, fiddler on the roof for me, win only. <laughs> So as I mean, as Stephen points out, there are plenty of good each way terms about. So 21 are declared as of uh, now. So just keep an eye on your place terms as well as your bookmakers. Now, the last feature race we want to talk about is the Fighting Fifth at Newcastle, of course, the 315. Now, Apatante does look like the worthy favourite for this one. But Vincent, what do you see in this race? What kind of value do you think there could be in some of the more outsider or outside chances? Well, the first thing here is Epitante won the race last year, as you say, but hasn't won a race since. That's always a worry. Um, I, the, the horse that's, that's probably um, going to be over bet here, and I wouldn't fancy, is the Nichols horse, Mon Moral. Um, Skip Cheltenham last year won a British only grade one in entry. That's that's a worry for me. Like, it, if, he, if he'd beaten some of, the, some of the better Irish horses, you'd be saying, okay, but. Um, I, I don't think beating some of the English ones is going to be good enough just to be saying you're a high-class four-year-old. Um, four-year-olds, again, n not something I'd want here. I'd be, you'd, you'd prefer a battle-hardened horse. Epitante, okay, hasn't had a win, but at the same time, won the race last year, is a high-class animal, most likely the winner. Um, I think I'd be looking for something else to finish second rather than, rather than the Nichols horse. And uh, over to you as well, Stephen. What's your kind of value route into the fighting fifth? Well, I think the, the key to this race is going to be a right strongly run race, Joe. Not so sleepy. He's bound to tear off at a million miles an hour. Silver Street probably wants the front run. I think it's made for Epitante, to be honest. Um, she had back problems, I think. Didn't jump that fluently after winning first amount last season. Apparently, she's back A1 at home. She'll love decent East Growler. I think there is a bit of rain possible at Newcastle on Saturday, the last forecast I saw. So that wouldn't inconvenience her. She goes well on soft ground as well. Um, I thought she was the standout contender. I, I agree about Mon Mural. Mon Mural's got the classic, going to be very hard to place this time around profile. And so I are um, a terrific advert uh, for the trainer, prolific winner, all circumstances, fences, hurdles, whatever the ground is, sure to give running again. But I think Epitanti might be a class above these first time out. Uh, yeah, like you say, it should be a, fr a thrilling encounter anyway, regardless of what happens in the race. Now we're going to move on to our tips to kind of round off the show. Uh, and we're going to start off with Stephen.
So, Stephen, we're going to start with you. You were off last week, but you are leading the chase in terms of the profit that you've generated for Jump To It viewers. So let's take us through your tips for this week. Yeah, I think there's two good bets, Joe. Uh, one at Newbury, one at Newcastle. Newbury in the 115, I really like Killer Clown. Emma Lavelle, very progressive chaser, got good form over these fences last season. I thought ran better than the bare result on his seasonal debut after six months off at Aintree in the old Roan chase. He just blew up there on the home turn, allowed to come home in his own time. I think he'll be a lot fitter for this. He'll love the decent ground. He's a Newbury horse. Lavelle's hit form. I think there's more to come. He's only had a handful of runs over fences. There's more to come from him. He's around about seven or eight to one. I think that's a very fair price. And over at Newcastle, in a small field, uh, it's cut up this race, the 130. Cooper's Cross, I think, is an absolute certainty. I'll make him a very short price. Hopefully, he'll be odds against when the prices come out. Um, he landed an almighty gamble at Sedgefield. And the bare facts don't tell the true story, Joe. He only won right on the line there. But he had his run messed about, parked out wide. And the runner-up rather got first run and got away. And Cooper's Cross has only had two runs over fences. He's got loads more to come. He's owned by some very shrewd people. And I think they'll be mortified if he's beaten. Great stuff. Well, best of luck to you, Stephen, with your tips. And also, Ed, you put in a solid performance last week as well, of course, with uh, Captain Morgs winning for you. But just take us through some of your tips from last week and what you've got for us this weekend. Yeah, Dee, we're going with three this weekend. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we've touched on Thomas Darby. I just think he's the value call. Uh, it's six to one. He'll travel into the, the, the three miler at Newbury. And whether he goes through with his effort in the last furlong or not, I don't know. But uh, similar to Vincent, I just think Paisley Park, you know, touching 13 to eight in a few places is, is emotional money, in, in my view. So I think he's the value there. Um, earlier on in the card, pick Dorhey. For Paul Nichols, horse apps had been a bit of a slow burner over fences, absolutely bolted up at Foss last last time out. He must have decent ground. We've we've talked about this unusual dry snap during the winter. Well, it's the grounds come in his favour. I mean, co connections must have been absolutely laughing if you said they've had to water Newbury uh, at the end of November in order to take the sting out of it. Well, that kind of sums it up. He's going to get his ground. Uh, and, of course, he's back at the scene of his finest hour. He won the bet for a hurdle last year. I think two and a half miles, good ground fences here in a winnable race. He'll take a lot of beating. And then on the Saturday, as I said, my, my kind of two V the field for this show for some time have been a clap the rear of Fiddler on the Roof. I'm going with Fiddler on the Roof purely on the, the underfoot conditions. It just make me nervous for the Henry de Bromhead Raider, whereas I think everything is spot on for Fiddler on the Roof. Three and a quarter miles, yard flying, uh, the horse jumps well. He won on his list to race on the comeback. I think six to one is more than fair for him. So, yeah, that's my, um, my three, v the, three tips for the weekend, basically. We're fingers crossed for some big runs. Absolutely. Fingers crossed for those. And Vincent as well, you had a big good win with Buzz last week, but let's take us through your tips for this weekend. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is with Ed talking about that clap the rear, I'd be very keen on that now. Um, I know the ground is a slight worry. It did win its point to point and very similar ground. It was yielding, I think, when it won its point to point. So when it used to be with Liz Doyle, this horse, they think the world of this. And um, when it won the last day, Rachel Blackmore, she doesn't say a whole lot about the horses, but when she says it, it's a really really nice horse you can take it it's a bloody good horse and um i i'd be i'd be expecting that, that at the sort of prices if it goes in the ground it wins that that'll be my view on that but for my actual bets for the weekend the two i was looking at are both in fairy has and i'm going ground is the key for me and um, one i've mentioned already in the royal bond is my mate mozzie who's gonna uh, go and have a, a decent bet on that i thought that that sh it looks value if you can get the six to four and um, you've got two gordon elliott one second and third favorite one of them is definitely a soft ground horse the other one okay might ne necessarily run either they, you could this could cut up a lot with the um, the runners over the weekend and fairy house with the ground and then the other one is in the drinmore novice chase and um, i was going to go for beacon edge here to reverse form from down royal with lifetime ambition lifetime ambition is a fair horse of jessica harrington's it was a horse that ran up a sequence of seconds last year and once it got winning it hasn't stopped winning it's after winning i think three or four in a row now but it's all soft ground, heavy ground form. And um, Beacon Edge has form on decent ground, was only beaten a couple of lengths the last day. This trip will suit better as well. Everything, everything about it says to me that Beacon Edge will definitely finish in front of Lifetime Ambition. That should be enough to win. Might necessarily be, obviously, but it's worth a bet, I would have thought. 
Great stuff. Now, of course, if you do place a bet on any of the tips posed here on Jump To It, then of course we do ask that you gamble responsibly. But that wraps up for today's show. For more news, card opinions, whatever you want, basically all things Irish racing and UK racing as well, head on over to irishracing.com. We'll be back next week to review this weekend's action, as well as giving you more plenty of tips and betting advice. But thanks for watching of this edition of Jump To It.